All right. Are we ready? Somewhere. Hello and welcome. My name is Grant Strobel. I am the chairman of the University of Michigan chapter of Young Americans for Freedom, and I'm on the National Board of Governors for Young Americans for Freedom as well. First, I would like to thank Mr. Shapiro for joining us tonight. I would also like to thank our generous donors, the Fred R. Allen Lecture Series with the Young America's Foundation and the University of Michigan Central Student Government, along with several other private donors. Young Americans for Freedom advances the idea of free enterprise, limited government, and a strong national defense on campus through our efforts to bring back the screening of American Sniper, our 9-11 memorial, and through our recent debate between Dinesh D'Souza and Bill Ayers. With an audience over 500 and an online audience of over 50,000. Our mission is to create intellectual diversity and break through the culture of political correctness plaguing our nation's college campuses. As you may know, there are... As you may know, there are several threats to free speech on campus, at, on this campus at the University of Michigan. The word crazy can be a microaggression according to the inclusive language campaign. Safe spaces are issued for events just because their ideas disagree with theirs and are so offensive. And there is a bias incident hotline to report things that you don't agree with. And people are being subjected to ethics investigations just because of their beliefs. These issues are a barrier to civil, respectful, intellectual discussions that we should be having at the University of Michigan about the issues of the day. <laughs> this is why Ben Shapiro is here with us today. And I expect respect from my fellow Wolverines. Please listen. Please be respectful and engage in civil discussion afterwards. Ben Shapiro entered UCLA at the age of 16 and graduated summa cum laude in June 20, 2004 with a BA in political science. He then graduated from Harvard Law School, cum laude, in June of 2007. Shapiro was hired by Creator Syndicate at only the age of 17 to become the youngest nationally syndicated columnist in the United States. His columns are printed in major newspapers and websites, including townhall.com and ABC News, and has been quoted in publications, a variety of publications nationwide, including the Wall Street Journal. He is also a best-selling author, including his best-selling book, Brainwashed, How Universities Indoctrinate America's Youth, Porn Generation, How Social Liberalism is cult Corrupting Our Future, and Project President, Bad Hair and Botox on the Road to the White House. Shapiro has appeared on hundreds of radio and television shows around the nation, including O'Reilly, Factor on Fox, In the Money on CNN, and Scarborough Country on MSNBC. Ben is currently the editor-in-chief of the DailyWire.com and host of the Ben Shapiro Show. Without further delay, please join me in welcoming Ben Shapiro. Well, thank you for having me. And before I start, I just want to make a quick note here. If you followed me for any amount of time, you'll know that I am not a fan of Donald Trump. Uh, I, uh, uh, the last week, uh, I, on Megyn Kelly's show, in fact, I called him, I think that the exact phrase was, a, a smoking pile of human debris. Uh, but, but, there is only one thing that could make me say or do anything pro-Trump, and that is all of the precious snowflakes who find it so offensive that people write chalk messages on the ground, they have to whine and cry about it on a national level. So, in the name of free speech,
with that out of the way, thanks to Young America's Foundation. Thanks also to Fred R. Allen for sponsoring this lecture series. Today, we're going to talk about all of the dumb, idiotic, foolish, empty, counterproductive words that your professors and your fellow students use in order to shut down debate, prevent discussion, and ensure that no open dialogue can be had. This is really nothing new. Since the 60s and 70s, the left on campus has been attempting to quash dialogue by using various terms of art, ranging from tolerance to diversity. The faces change, but the ideological fascism actually doesn't. It's just that the people who originally took over the campuses are now your administrators, and now the new left is trying to oust them because I guess they want their jobs in 20 years. So today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through and we're going to discuss and debunk five of the most commonly used and stupidest terms that the left likes to use on campus, the Hall of, the, the hall of Fame of Idiocy. This will be diversity, white privilege, trigger warnings, microaggressions, and safe spaces. We'll go through all of these, so it'll be a, a busy evening. Now, warning, this all may make some folks on the left upset. And fortunately for you, I don't care. <laughs> So let's just jump right in because there's a lot to get to. Let's start with diversity. So there's one kind of diversity that the left likes and one kind of diversity that the left really doesn't like. The kind of diversity the left really is not fond of is diversity of thought. This is something that is not valued in, in any real way. A few weeks ago, I spoke at, at Cal State University in Los Angeles, and I'm glad that this is not Cal State University of Los Angeles where we actually, I actually get to talk to you guys, which is really exciting without the fire alarm going off or people barricading the doors and trying to beat up people who are trying to enter. That's very exciting. The reason that things went wrong at Cal State LA is because a few days before I was scheduled to speak at Cal State LA, the president of the university, uh, a dunderhead named William Cavino, uh, he decided that he was going to revoke my invitation to speak. Right? He was going to step in, he was going to intervene, I could not be allowed to speak. And here is what he wrote, and it's pretty Orwellian. Here is the note that he wrote. He wrote, after careful consideration, I have decided that it will be best for our campus community if we reschedule Ben Shapiro's appearance for a later date so that we can arrange for him to appear as part of a group of speakers with differing viewpoints on diversity. Such an event will better represent our university's dedication to the free exchange of ideas and the value of considering multiple viewpoints. In other words, in order to create multiple viewpoints, one of the viewpoints had to be completely shut down. There was no speech scheduled for the future. There was no event scheduled for the future. It was a simple cancellation. Diversity here meant that I had to shut up. I mean, the fact is that I was the diversity. There was no one else on campus who was saying these things. But the diversity that they wanted was not this kind of diversity. The kind of diversity that the left loves, the kind of tolerance the left loves, is restricted solely and only to diversity of skin color, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of birthplace. This is the only thing that the left truly cares about. They don't care about whether you're a good human being or a bad human being. They care about whether you're a black human being or a white human being, which is, to my mind, deeply racist. If you don't care about someone's values, all you care about is the color of their skin. To me, that's the definition of racism. But the left would prefer if, if they were given an opportunity to sit in a room full of 12 white saints or a TV diverse gang, and when I say TV diverse gang, I mean the kind of gang that you see on television shows that doesn't really exist very often in real life, where it's, it's, a, it's a Mexican and a black guy and a lesbian and an American Indian, right? <laughs> they would prefer to sit with this diverse TV gang because the diverse TV gang is diverse. And as we know, diversity is our strength, even if you're just trying to rob a liquor store. So. <laughs> This sort of begs the question, which is, why is the left so focused on diversity of skin color? Because as I say, diversity of skin color is meaningless because skin color should be meaningless. The reason that the left is focused solely and only on diversity of skin color is because the left really only has one value. That the left's value when you boil it down, and the right's value is sort of the opposite of this. The left's value when you boil it down is fairness of outcome, equality of outcome. Not equality of opportunity, not when President Obama says a fair shot, a fair shake, a level playing field. That's not really what the left is into. The left is into equality of outcome. And any inequality of outcome is evidence that, that discrimination has taken place. Any sort of discrepancy, any sort of inequality is inequity. And therefore, if you have a group of people who are not as successful as another group of people, that's not due to individuals within that group making bad decisions or individuals in another group making good decisions, that must be due to some sort of innate racism. It must be due to some sort of innate ill that society has foisted upon the less successful group, no matter what. 
And this is where you get into the notion of white privilege. This is how you go from diversity, which is not diversity of thought, it's diversity of skin color, to white privilege. Because in order to achieve diversity of skin color, an equal outcome for people of all races, regardless of their behavior, what you have to do is you have to say that the reason that some people aren't part of, of the successful group, that the reason some people are less successful than others, has nothing to do with their virtue. It has to do instead with the fact that society is mean to them. It has to do with white privilege. And we have to tear down white privilege. Now, what's really seductive about the idea of white privilege, which is basically the idea that the founding fathers were a bunch of, they're, they're a bunch of dead old white men, many of whom were slave owners, who designed this system solely for the benefit of other rich white men who were also slave owners. And they designed this system so it would last in perpetuity. Racism and evil is written into the American DNA from the outset. It will be written into the DNA of America forever. It is inexpiable. There is no way to get rid of it. It is going to be with us from, to, from the beginning till the end of time, and it's going to be a, a, a cloud hovering over the head of racial minorities now and forevermore. And if you're born white, you're born into this privilege, and if you're born non-white, then you're a victim of this privilege. This idea is very seductive. It's seductive for, for pretty much everyone, actually. It's seductive if you're a minority, because if you're a minority and you're not doing that well, it's a lot easier to say, this is society's fault, than to say, maybe I should have made better decisions with my life. And if you are a white person, right, if you are, if you are the person who is the beneficiary, the supposed beneficiary of white privilege, you're the white, heterosexual, cisgender male, right, if, if you are that guy, then the only way that you can gain moral credibility with everybody else is to scourge yourself. It makes you feel better. It makes you feel more morally virtuous because you've separated yourself from these other evil... There are white racists, but you're not one of them. And the way we know you're not a racist is because you say that all the other white people are racists. Right? The way that we know that you are a good person is because you admit that your success is due to your privilege. It is not due in any way to the decision-making that you have engaged in. So, the, 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 there's, you know, this is all very seductive. There's only one problem. It's not true. It's not true. In a free country, people largely get what they deserve. If you make responsible decisions, if you decide to do good things with your life, if you make well-thought-out decent decisions with your life, you're going to finish off better than, than if you make bad decisions with your life in a free country. And this is largely true. So if that's true, if we live in a free country and individual decisions end up with individual consequences, then why do you end up with discrepancies? Well, the answer would be obvious, right? Some people make good decisions and some people make bad decisions. Now, this is a kind of privilege. It's what I like to call decision privilege. We all have free will. We have the capacity to make decisions. So one of those decision privileges, probably the most important decision privilege, is two-parent family privilege. Right? If you grew up in a two-parent family, you are likely to be significantly more successful than if you grew up in a single-parent family. And this is true across races, right? without correlation to race. If you grew up in a black family with two parents in the home, your poverty rate in the United States is 7%. If you grew up in a white family, with a single parent in the home, your poverty rate is 22%. What happened to white privilege? Why didn't the evil white privilege monster come in and stop those black families from, from producing productive children and actually getting jobs? What, what happened? Did the white privilege monster miss them? And why is it that the white privilege monster isn't coming in and helping out all of these single white women so that they're not poor? Why are they so much poorer than these, than these black people who clearly are the victims of systemic white privilege? The answer is because it's not white privilege. It's about the decisions that you make. And unfortunately, one of the reasons for higher intergenerational poverty in the black community is higher single motherhood rate. If it is true that you are more likely to be poor if you are in a single parent family, then more single parent families would suggest more poverty, which of course is true. And, it, and it's, it's risen, and the rates of single motherhood have risen dramatically across races, but particularly in the black community. In the black community, the single motherhood rate in 1960 was 20%. Today, it is in excess of 70%. In the white community in 1960, it was 5%, by the way. Today, it's in excess of 40. So it's going the wrong direction for both groups. And this creates intergenerational poverty. It's creating challenges that are individual in nature. It's not because of bias. It's not because of institutional racism. Because it's very hard to argue that white privilege is worse now than it was in 1960. Right? If it were, so why that increase? Why that dramatic increase? Well, one of the reasons is because government has taken over the parenting role and the providing role, so people feel more free to have children without a husband in the home. And social standards have changed, so women feel no moral obligation to marry, and men feel no moral obligation to take care of their kids, all of which creates more poverty, not less poverty. It makes lives worse. It turns out these decisions, this has nothing to do with white privilege. 
A black guy doesn't knock up his black girlfriend and take off because some white guy told him to do it. And the same thing is true in the white community, right? It doesn't have to do with privilege. It has to do with your being a jackass. Don't be a jackass, and it turns out your kid's life will be better, and so will yours. <laughs> Here's another privilege. The not committing crimes privilege. It turns out that if you don't commit crimes, you will not go to jail in outsized numbers. It's magic that way. Right, so usually, this is, it, it's, it's this point where, where the left starts to lose it. So when you talk about the not committing crimes privilege, the suggestion is that the criminal justice system, as President Obama likes to say, is wildly biased against black people particularly. It's out to get all the black folks, which is why virtually all the prisons are filled with Tim Robbins, Shawshank Redemption folks who are all black. Right? They're all innocent. Everybody in prison is innocent. And it's just that the police have been going around arresting innocent black folks for no reason and throwing them in prison. Only one problem, this isn't true. Right? It turns out that if you want to avoid prison, the easiest way to do that is to actually not commit a crime. Here's the fact about the supposedly evil and racist justice system. It under-prosecutes murder in minority communities. It under-prosecutes murder. It under-prosecutes felonies in minority communities because there aren't enough police officers in minority communities to police all of the crime, which is one of the reasons you have higher crime rates in minority communities. And when the police do come into contact with folks, there's this myth out there that's been pervaded by the Black Lives Matter group that the police have gone hog wild in recent years, just randomly shooting black people, hands up, don't shoot, which is an absolute lie. The idea that the cops are going around targeting black people, starting confrontations and shooting them for no reason. Statistically, this is absolutely false. The hands up, don't shoot story itself is absolutely false and was a lie from beginning to end. Michael Brown was a thug who punched a police officer, tried to take his gun off of him, fired it in the car, tried to run away, turned around and charged the cop by eyewitness testimony from black witnesses and by physical evidence. Okay? So, the... Here is the fact about confrontations between white police officers and black, and black perpetrators. According to a study from Peter Moskus at John Jay College of Criminal Justice at City University of New York, when police are in a confrontational situation with a white guy and they're in a confrontational situation with a black guy, they're actually significantly more likely, statistically significantly more likely, to shoot the white guy than the black guy. Which makes sense, because if you shoot the black guy, even if it's justified, you end up like Officer Darren Wilson and your life is ruined. Right? So the fact is that the, the justice system actually discriminates against white people when it comes to confrontations with the cops. As early as 1994, the Department of Justice surveyed felony cases, this would be Bill Clinton's Department of Justice, surveyed felony cases in the country's 75 largest urban areas and found lower felony prosecution rates for blacks than whites. Okay, how about another aspect of white privilege? White privilege of racial profiling, right? The idea that stop and frisk in New York, for example, that was racial profiling. The cops were out to get blacks and Hispanics, and that's why communist moron mayor Bill de Blasio has to come in and fix everything by getting rid of stop and frisk, and then surprise, surprise, the crime rate goes up. So that, the idea that this was used for racial profiling is statistically untrue. It is statistically untrue. From January to June 2008, 98% of all gun assailants in New York City were black or Hispanic. 98%. Okay, what was the percentage of people who were being pulled over for stop and frisk during that same period who were black or Hispanic? 85%. So in other words, the police were statistically under-profiling black and Hispanic people in terms of the amount of gun violence that was going on in the community, and stop and frisk was largely used as a measure to prevent gun violence because if you talk to cops who worked in New York City, they'll tell you this, the idea, and, and the courts as well, the idea for, of stop and frisk is you have to have reasonable suspicion that somebody is carrying drugs or a weapon. It's much easier to identify a weapon. You see a bump on the hip or you see people walking in a funny way. Right? So you would think that if they wanted to go out and round up all the black and Hispanic folks, then they would probably have 100% rates, but it was actually 85% rates as opposed to 98% of the actual gun assailants. How about driving while black, right? This is another big one. The idea that every time a cop pulls somebody over, it must be because the person was driving while black. There is an alternative explanation, which is the cops pull lots of people over, and very often it's unpleasant, and when I get pulled over, I also think the cop's a jerk, right? It's, it, that, that happens a lot, it turns out. So one of the famous cases that's used for the idea of driving while black and that this is common is the case of New Jersey, right? New Jersey, this, they have this racist, horrible highway system where the cops are going out there and spotting the black people through the tinted windows and they're saying, okay, we're going to pull you over right now and we are going to make sure that we pull you over just because of the color of your skin. There's only one problem with this, okay? So the DOJ actually sued the, the police department and then they did a study. And the study was 
how many people in New Jersey who are black are actually, uh, who are speeding are actually black? What's the percentage? So what they found is the police were pulling over a disproportionate number of black people. 23% of all the people they were pulling over were black. Unfortunately, 25% of all the speeders in the state of New Jersey were also black. So that driving while black thing, it's not a thing. How about sentencing disparities? This has been a big one too, right? The idea that if you have a black guy and a white guy and they are in the same situation, the black guy spends more time in prison. This has not been true for 30 years at the very least. This has not been true. It is statistically not real. Okay? The Department of Justice found this as early as the mid-80s. Okay? And how about, for example, the one that people love to use nowadays is the disparity between crack cocaine sentencing and powder cocaine sentencing. Right, the idea is that crack cocaine is used by black folks. The vast majority of people who are convicted for distributing crack are black. The vast majority of people who are convicted for distributing powder cocaine are white. So isn't that a sentencing disparity based on race? No, it isn't. The reason that crack cocaine is prosecuted more heavily is because it is cheaper, it is more addictive, and it is easier to distribute. Originally, the people who wanted crack cocaine punished more severely were black legislators from the inner city who were sick of watching their cities ravaged by crack cocaine. Right? And so they changed the law so that crack cocaine was prosecuted differently than powder cocaine. By the way, here's your easy proof. The vast majority of people in the United States who are prosecuted for distribution of crystal meth are white. The sentence for five grams of crystal meth is exactly, precisely the same on the federal level as the sentence for five grams of crack cocaine. Okay, because again, Easy, cheap to distribute, very addictive. But all of this is white privilege, right? All of these disparities have to be white privilege. It can't be that more black people are committing crimes. It can't be that crack is more dangerous than, than powder cocaine in terms of distribution. It can't be that more black people are in jail because more black people are being convicted, because more black people are involved in the, in the, in the issues that, that lead to conviction. It can't be any of that. It's all white privilege. Everything is white privilege. When black people riot in Baltimore, a majority black city, with a majority black police force, with a black police commissioner, with a majority black city council, with a black mayor, with a black president, with a black attorney general, that's all white privilege. <laughs> and, you know, if we're going to talk about groups that are really disproportionately benefiting from the American dream and how the system has been constructed for them, then we really ought not to be talking about the white folks. We ought to be talking about those darned Asians. Right? It's Asian privilege we really ought to worry about because Asians are now the the highest earning subgroup in the United States, they earn more than white folks, and it turns out that Asians get into better colleges at a higher rate than white folks. And when I was going to college, it was 1600 on the SATs, right? 1600 was the perfect score. Princeton University did a full study, a full workup of, of affirmative action, essentially, and what they found is that black people at top universities were being given a 230 point bonus on the SATs. Asians were being penalized 50 points, which of course they deserve. Because, let's face it, there's been Asian privilege in this country since the very founding. <laughs> Our founders were rich Asian men who came along and wrote the Constitution specifically for the benefit of Asians. <laughs> Which explains why, mysteriously, the Constitution is in Korean. So it turns out that white privilege, when you hold up all the claims of white privilege to the light, is actually just a, a chimera. It's just a myth. It disappears. And the reason it disappears is because there's no evidence to it. It's something that makes people feel good to say. But as soon as you say, okay, show me what the privilege is and how the impact has nothing to do with individual behavior, it just disappears. Because in a free country, as I said, the basic principle of a free country is your actions correlate to your outcome. That's the definition of a free country. And we live in a free country. So the left is faced with a problem now, because if it turns out that indeed, no matter how many measures you take, people's behavior is going to correlate with their outcome, if it turns out you can't achieve a quality of outcome without use of force, well, then the left is faced with two options, and they take both of them. One is they actually use force to force different outcomes. Right? We actually saw this this week with the Obama administration pushing through their Housing and Urban Development Department the idea that if you have a third bedroom, you need to rent it to O.J. Simpson because if you don't rent your third bedroom to a criminal, then that must be because you are actually a racist. Right? It can't be that you don't want to rent to a criminal because criminals commit crimes. Right? You don't want them renting your third bedroom because I wouldn't want a criminal in my third bedroom. It must be just a tacit stand-in for racism. And the reason for this, according to Obama, is because more black people commit crimes than white people, and therefore crime and being black are coincident, which seems slightly racist, honestly. 
But this is the one measure they take, is that we're going to use the government to get rid of all of these inequalities. The other measure that they take is they change the metric itself. So they say, okay, we can't achieve equality of outcome in every situation. There, there won't be equality of outcome, but we can achieve equality of feelings. <laughs> Everyone can be a special, precious rosebud. We can all be snowflakes, each one of us unique in our own special way, shining in the sun. Right? And in order, to, in order to achieve this, of course, we have to make sure that your self-esteem is never dinged, right? It's never dented. And in order to make sure your self-esteem is never dinged or dented, we have to make sure your feelings are never hurt, which means that we have to shut up everyone who disagrees with you. We have to have a completely sterile space around you, right? We have to have trigger warnings, for example. We have to have trigger warnings. We have to warn you if something is going to offend you. Because God forbid something should offend you in any way, and you might learn something from that offense. God forbid you should be in an uncomfortable situation. But you'll find, I mean, you're young, and I'm sure you already know this, you'll find that many of the most important things you learn in life come from being in uncomfortable situations. I know this because I'm married. Right? <laughs> Right? Life does not come with trigger warnings, and the fact that you are being pushed into a trigger warning society means that when you leave, you are completely unprepared for everyday life. I mean, this is pathetic stuff. And then, when the trigger warnings don't work, then we have to move on to the higher level, which is microaggressions. We have to police microaggressions. Microaggressions are worse than trigger warnings. Trigger warnings are just, I'm going to warn you what I'm going to say, and then I'm going to say it. Microaggressions are, I can't even say it, because if I say it, it is a form of aggression against you, and therefore, you get to be aggressive in turn. The very word microaggression is fascist in nature. It suggests that verbiage is aggression. Verbiage is not aggression. Verbiage can be offensive. Rhetoric can be offensive. You can feel bad about it. It is not aggression. Physical violence is aggression. Okay, to, to equate these two things is to suggest that if I say something you don't like, you therefore get to treat me with physical violence. And the left has indeed moved in this direction in bizarre ways. And the most the, the easiest example that comes to mind is, uh, I don't know how many of you watch CNN headline news. Uh, I would venture to say zero because they have no ratings. But, <laughs> but you know, microaggressions is, uh, you're all in, in school, so you know. Microaggression is like if you say he instead of she, or he or she instead of Z, which isn't even a word. Or if you say, where are you from? And then people take it to mean, oh, you must be from a foreign country, as opposed to, no, I just mean like, which part of the city are you from, right? That all of these are microaggressions. They're subjective, subjective evaluations of whether something is offensive, and then we're all supposed to shut up because you are subjectively offended, so you get to shut everyone down because of your, because of your, your mental fascism. So, Back to CNN Headline News. So about eight months ago, I was on CNN Headline News to discuss the, the Caitlyn Jenner phenomenon. This is right after Caitlyn Jenner had, had come out as transgender, and the world was trying to decide whether Caitlyn Jenner should be given the Medal of Honor or granted direct sainthood by the Pope. And this, this was the great debate, whether, whether Caitlyn Jenner, uh, whose, whose great act of heroism was having some surgeries, injections, remaining extraordinarily wealthy and wearing rich brocades, deserved an honorary burial spot in Arlington National Cemetery. <laughs> and so, you know, they, they, had me, they, they called me up and they, they wanted me to talk about Caitlyn Jenner being given the Heroism Award by ESPN, be, which, whatever. And so, they, <laughs> and as I've said before, our standards of heroism have dropped somewhat since Normandy. So, <clears throat> So, you know, my perspective on transgenderism is, is very clear, and, it's, and I've been very clear about it for a very long time. I believe in this thing called biology. I believe in this thing called chromosomal biology. I don't believe there's a magic machine that makes men into women or women into men. I think that if you have the biology of a man, you are indeed a man, and what you think in your head does not make it so. If you think you're Napoleon Bonaparte, you're not, and if you think that you're a woman when you're a man, you are still a man who thinks he's a woman. And I think it is actually cruelty, I think it's cruelty to people who suffer from gender dysphoria to suggest that the mental illness that is gender dysphoria can be cured by cutting up your body. That is not the problem. And the proof that it's not the problem is that after people cut up their bodies, their suicide rate is precisely the same as it was before they had the surgery. So passing this off as oh, the only reason the suicide rate is 40% is because people are mean to transgenders. That's a bunch of crap. The reason that the suicide rate is 40% is because there is a high comorbidity between depression and suicidality and gender dysphoria. Okay, so this is my perspective. So they have me on the show to, to say this perspective because I'm the only person in L.A. in like a 20-mile like radius who believes this. Uh, and... <laughs> 
And so they, they call me up and they say, okay, we want you to come on Dr. Drew's show, which, I mean, all of CNN headline news is low rated. Dr. Drew is actually, he actually has negative ratings. People who have yet to be born will never watch his show. <laughs> so the producer brings me into the green room and the producer says, you know, I want you to say what you want to say. We really need to get the ratings up. <laughs> He's admitting to the guests, right? We, no one watches this show. And I was like, well, I could have stayed home and, and just talked to, my, talked to my wife and had more viewers. But the... <laughs> But he says, we need to get the ratings up. And also, by the way, I used to produce for Jerry Springer. It was at this point I should have started to have second thoughts. But I didn't. So, they, so they, they bring me into the room, and it's me, and there are six other people on the panel. And all six of the other people on the panel are leftists, which makes it almost fair for them. And, <laughs> and so we're, we're having this, this discussion and, you know, they, enter, they go around the panel and everybody is just gushing over how heroic Caitlyn Jenner is. Is Caitlyn Jenner, you know, the son of God or actually God? Which member of the Trinity is Caitlyn Jenner? And finally they come to me and I say, I don't understand as a society why we are participating in, in a mass delusion. Why is this helpful in any way? And at this point, the, the person sitting next to me, this is the way they see it, the person sitting next to me is a fellow named Zoe Turr. Zoe Turr is a transgender male to female, right? Formerly Bob Turr, is a newsman in LA, and now he is Zoe Turr. So Zoe Turr is sitting right next to me, and Zoe starts to get very agitated. And Zoe turns to me and says, little boy, you don't know anything about biology. And I said, well, I know enough about chromosomes to know how they work. And I also know that every single cell in Caitlyn Jenner's body, ironically, with the exception of Caitlyn Jenner's sperm cell, which reside in his female testicles, right, that, Cait that Caitlyn Jenner's cells, right, all of them, except for some of his sperm cells, contain Y chromosomes. And he says, well, you know, you don't know everything about chromosomes. I said, well, he, you, don't know, you don't know everything about genetics. And I said, well, what are your genetics, sir? And it was, and it was the sir that set him off. Uh, uh, and as I've said before, right hand to God, it never occurred to me that this was like the end of the world because I was brought up in a world where you call men sir and you call women ma'am and the guy's voice was at least an octave lower than mine. <laughs> so I say this and, um, and Zoe turns to me, and this is on national TV, it's live, and turns to me and grabs me by the back of the neck, right, on national TV and says, if you don't cut that out, you'll go home in an ambulance. Which, number one, doesn't make sense because you don't go home in an ambulance. <laughs> and I mean, I was slightly taken aback because this had not been how I really saw my day going when I woke up that morning. Um, and, uh, and, and so I said, this seems mildly inappropriate for a political conversation. Uh, and at this point, this is the punchline, so I, all this is going on. At this point, all the other people on the panel, all of them, right, all the leftists on the panel, instead of saying, Zoe, you're not allowed to grab people and, and assault them on national television. This is a bad thing, Zoe. Right? Instead of saying that, they immediately swiveled and turned to, well, you know, Ben, what you just said is so offensive. You knew that Zoe was going to react that way, and I can honestly tell you, I did not know Zoe, no, Zoe was going to react this way. And... And it, but it turned into a, how could you possibly say this? What a microaggression. And the microaggression required a macroaggression. And therefore, we all understand where Zoe is coming from when Zoe grabs you by the back and the neck and threatens to send you home in an ambulance. And by the way, these, these sort of threats of violence didn't stop at the end of the segment. As Zoe's walking off the set, Zoe turns to me and says, I'll see you in the parking lot. <laughs> really? <laughs> And then, later on, uh, and then later on Twitter, Zoe goes on Twitter and, uh, and threatens to curb stomp me. Uh, all of which I thought is just not very ladylike behavior. <laughs> but the point is this, right? Whether you think I'm a jerk or not, and believe me, there are plenty who do. Uh, you know, the, the, the point is that you cannot like what I say. That doesn't give you the right to put your hands on me. In a civilized society, the definition of civilization is that you get to speak freely and no one puts their hands on you, right? There's no violence in response to things that offend you, right? You just deal with it because that's a free society. And if we don't have that, we don't have anything. Microaggression culture takes that away from people and grants them a patina of legitimacy in reacting with aggression to words. And once we've reached that, then the, the only common value that holds us together is gone, right? There are two common values that hold us together. 
One is the idea that your actions have consequences and the, your, personal, your, your personal deliberations and decisions have consequences. And the other is that we get to say what we want and not get punched in the face. These are basically the two main principles of Western civilization. And, un and unfortunately, they're under attack by the left. Both of them are. And fin so finally, once you've gotten past the trigger warnings and you've, and you've decided to wipe away white privilege because all of the white people have grabbed their scourge and whipped themselves into a frenzy screaming mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, and you have your microaggression culture and everything has been banned, finally you have your magical fascist safe space. Right? You get to live inside your little cube of fun, you alone, with all the people who love you, which is no one. You just get to sit there. You get to sit there. I mean, it's basically like being in your dorm room. The only difference is there's no porn in your safe space. And... And your safe space is just you sitting there, but you feel warm and special about yourself because you will never be faced at any point with anything that offends you or makes you feel bad. All of this makes people crazy. It makes people legitimately crazy. And I, I say that advisedly. Jonathan Haidt is a psychologist from New York University, and he writes this. He says, the recent collegiate trend of uncovering allegedly racist, sexist, classist, or otherwise discriminatory microaggressions doesn't incidentally teach students to focus on small or accidental slights. Its purpose is to get students to focus on them and then relabel the people who have made such remarks as aggressors. Right? This is actually making people sick because it turns out that the opposite of, of this is what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. For the psych majors in the room, you know this is the only form of psychotherapy that actually has clinical results over the long haul. Cogn cognitive behavioral therapy is the idea that you are having a bad chain of thought. Somebody offends you, and you have a bad chain of thoughts that leads you to a dark place. Cognitive behavioral therapy, your therapist sits down and they say, is it possible you're misconstruing this? It is possible that what the person said is just not that important. Can we think about what they said and then maybe just break that chain of thought? The left wants to do away with that. That's what this trigger warning microaggression safe space culture does. It destroys that, right? It, it reinforces your paranoia. Yes, everyone's out to get you. Yes, everything you find subjectively offensive is meant in the worst possible way. Everyone wants to hurt you, right? That's what society is all about. And when you, ha you create a group of people who feel like constant victims, they're more likely to engage in violence. They're more likely, if you feel like you're victimized all the time, you're more likely to, to lash out at someone. And this is, again, true on a sociological basis. Professor Roy Baumeister is the author of a book called Evil, Inside Human Violence and Cruelty. And he says that evil is basically reserved to people who think that they're victims. If you ever think about people who, who are truly evil in human history, they all thought of themselves as victims of something else. Right? Hitler thought of himself as a victim of the Jews, therefore he was justified in murdering all of the Jews. Right? O.J. Simpson thought that he was a victim of his wife's infidelity, therefore he was justified in going and murdering his ex-wife. All bad people don't think of themselves as bad people. They think of themselves as victim heroes. Right? That's how they think of themselves. When you create a society full of people who are rewarded for a victimhood status, you are creating a very risky society. Here's what Baumeister says. He says, hypersensitive people who often think their pride is being assaulted are potentially dangerous. Even when a neutral observer would conclude that no serious provocation occurred, it is still important to recognize that, in the perpetrator's own view, he or she was merely responding to an attack. This leads down the road to fascism. And it's affecting people of our age group. There's a poll that came out today that showed that on college campuses, more than two-thirds of the people between, you know, of your age group, two-thirds of those people thought that there should be actual prosecution for, for what they called hate speech, which is to say any speech that offends people. In, a, in November 2015, there was a Pew poll, and it found 40% of people aged 18 to 34, that's my age group too, so that's all of us, essentially, believe that the government should be given the power to prevent people from making, quote, statements that are offensive to minority groups. This would involve repeal of the little thing we like to call the First Amendment. Four out of ten people our age agree with this principle. On college campuses, that number, as I mentioned, is well above 66%. All of this creates a very dangerous world. The left is taking a, a battering ram to those two fundamental bases I talked about, the two fundamental bases of Western civilization. You are responsible for your own actions, and you bear the consequences of those actions, and in a free society, you can say things without people assaulting you. They're taking a, a battering ram to this because they have to wipe out, they have to wipe out this whole system because this system ends in inequality. Now again, inequality is not inequity. Inequality is just inequality. You have to determine why exactly, you have to determine why exactly the inequality is there. Is the inequality there because there's discrimination and racism or is it there because some people make good decisions and some people make bad decisions? In the end, 
right, left, or center, all of us, doesn't matter your political perspective, we should all be able to agree on these two fundamental principles. These are the principles on which America was based. If you do not believe in these basic values, right, free speech and freedom of action and freedom to own those consequences, that is un-American. And that there's no common future for us. If you can't define liberty in the same way, if you refuse to define liberty in the same way, then you're going to end up with a country that is completely unworkable, a country that is tearing apart at the seams. And that's what I fear, and that's what I'm seeing on college campuses today. We all have an obligation to stand up and fight for these two principles. We have an obligation to stand up and fight for the ability to see American Sniper, even if you don't like it. We have to stand up and we have to fight for the ability to say to folks, listen, you want a better life? Lead your life. Make your life better. Don't rely on the government. Don't rely on the people who surround you. Rely on yourself. Because in a free society, thank God, thank God, in a free and open society like the United States, you can make something better of yourself. And if you are blocked from doing that, it will probably be because you make bad decisions, not because society is trying to stop you. Society doesn't care enough about you to try to stop you. It's your job to make your life better. And so long as we all believe that and we leave, our, leave each other alone to make our lives better, then the country really can be restored and we can reach unity again out of this chaos. Thanks so much. Happy to take your questions. So if anybody wants to ask questions, there will be a microphone in the middle, um, so you can just come on down and, and ask questions. Hopefully, if there are people who disagree, well, I'd like to take those people first. That's always more fun. In the meantime, I can just bash Trump for like another five minutes. It's, <laughs> that's been my usual mode lately, sir. How are you doing, Ben? Doing pretty well. How are you? Uh, good. I just want to talk to you about a um, question I have. Uh, how do I defeat the minimum wage argument about continuing to raise it as they have done just previously in California? Um, the people who are suggesting minimum wage don't know anything about business or economics, uh, and minimum wage invariably <clears throat> minimum wage is supposed to be an economic decision but it's based it's predicated largely on a, a moral vision of the world that is false and that is that somewhere these business people who are engaged in competition with each other with ever shrinking profit margins somewhere the McDonald's owner in his back room has a giant Scrooge McDuck money bin filled with gold and each night he goes there and he just swims around in it right and he's, and he's preventing all of his hard laborers who are flipping burgers from earning their, their rightful $200,000 a year. And so we need a minimum wage. The, point is, the, the, the problem with minimum wage and the reason it's economically ignorant is because competition in wages leads to lower wages, right? That's what it does. Just as competition in products leads to lower prices for the products. You artificially increasing the price of labor, all that does is it cuts out the profit margin and it means that somebody is going ha to have to be fired. Right? This is, every time minimum wage is tried, there is, if you, if you get rid of the confounds, there is a net loss in employment because, uh, as we all know, if you only have $30 to spend on your employees, and right now you're paying them each 10 bucks a head, if you'd raise that to 15 bucks a head, you have to lay somebody off. Right? Somebody has to get fired. Beyond that, it's pushing up the unemployment rate, particularly among the people who need those part-time jobs and those low-wage jobs. The people who disproportionately staff part-time and low-wage jobs are young minority folks. Right? And those people, their unemployment rate is soaring right now because if I'm going to pay $15 an hour for a burger flipper, he, he also better be able to recite cons. I mean, he better have another skill set, right? <laughs> because it turns out that, that anybody with a, with a functioning radial, radial bone and a prefrontal cortex can flip a burger. It's not that hard a job. Right? It's, a, it's an entry-level job, which isn't to say it's not, it, it is honorable to work, but let's not pretend that you're, that you're curing cancer here. Right, which is the reason why people who actually try to cure cancer get paid more. So, the, so the, the idea of minimum wage is foolish. The easiest way to debunk this is to say, okay, you say it should be a $15 minimum wage. I'll agree with you. It should be, I say it should be a $2,000 minimum wage. $2,000 an hour. Why not? These people have money in the back room, right? They've got that Scrooge McDuck money. Ben, we know that they're jipping people. We know that they've got this money hanging around. Where are you coming up with this $15 an hour number? I mean, is it straight from your colon, or does it pass through the small intestine first? Like, what... <laughs> 
you know, the, the, the problem with the minimum wage is that for the left, every argument is a moral argument, not an economic argument. So you have to take the morality of the argument away. It is immo uh, beyond that. There is a fundamental argument here. It is fundamentally immoral for you to come in and tell somebody that they are not allowed to make a free and binding contract. Okay, no one is being chained to their grill. If somebody doesn't want to work for that wage, they can leave. Right? And who are you to tell the 17-year-old black kid who wants to work for $7.50 an hour that he, is that he is forbidden by law from taking a job at $7.50 an hour? Who are you to do that? Right? This makes you a totalitarian. It's a totalitarian rule. So that, that, that's the way I would argue against it. Thank you, sir. Hi, Ben. Uh, Howdy. Big fan, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I uh, finished my degree requirements this past February as a SOC major. That's the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> the good news is I'm a 22-year-old bad. And uh, I was that guy who raised your points regarding education, avoiding crime, illegitimacy, decision, mm -hmm. uh, things that you can Decision there. privilege, yeah. Additionally, I took an interest in discussing black slave owners and white slaves in America that the textbooks and the professors conveniently omitted. Furthermore, I caught your remarks regarding the DSM being highly politicized at Salisbury. And if I may add, Al Francis, the guy who very literally wrote the DSM-4, said in 2010, there is no definition of a mental disorder. It's bullshit. I mean, you just can't define it. Well, I, I, I appreciate it. I just want to get to the question mark at the okay, end. Okay, right there. Given these examples, why does the left continue to present one-sided views relatively unchallenged, and what can be done to bring intellectual objectivity back to the curriculum? Well, I mean, if the question is how do we restore balance to college campuses, the answer is you lie that you're a conservative until you're a professor and then you come out of the closet. Right? I mean, that's, that's legitimately like the only way to do it because the reality is that there is a tremendous bias in hiring against conservatives because the way that, that becoming a professor works is you have to have a professor sponsor your dissertation. Leftists don't tend to sponsor people who want to write dissertations about conservative ideas. It's, it's, it's a perpetuating cycle. So, you know, the, the, the way, what I have suggested, and I suggest this to all students, I get this question a lot from conservative students. What do I do if I have a lefty professor? Write like a leftist. That's the answer, right, like a leftist. I did it when I was at UCLA. In class, I argued openly like a right-winger, and then on my test, I wrote like Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Except slightly more coherent and incomplete sentences. Hi, Ben. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, our university really needs this. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk on how the left has dominated in the social um, aspects of politics and how the right really doesn't try to, they just focus on economics, but the left keeps hammering, 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 saying we need to change the morals of society, we need to change these things. Mm -hmm. um, so how can the right combat this? Well, I mean, I, I've mentioned Jonathan Haidt before. He has, he has a very good book um, uh, about, uh, called The Righteous Mind, about the various aspects of, of moral drive and what drives us as human beings to be interested in morality. The left bases almost its entire argument on fairness. It's always fairness. It's fairness this and fairness that. It's all, but, but they're always framing their questions in ways that, that benefit them. I think that it's been a big mistake for the right to abandon the social playing field because I think that social policy helps define you know, who we are. I'm, by the way, I tend to be extremely libertarian when it comes to government policy. So, for example, gay marriage, right? I'm not libertarian on abortion because murder is murder, and the government prosecutes murder whether that human is in your womb or whether the human is outside your womb. <laughs> but when it comes... But when it comes to same-sex marriage, I'm actually libertarian, and the reason I'm libertarian is because I think the government basically sucks at everything. And so the government's idea of we're going to forward straight marriage was obviously a failure. And what I don't want is a government that crams down its perceptions of what relationships ought to be on religious people, which is what's going to happen now that same-sex marriage has been, has been you know, made mandatory at the state level in terms of legalization uh, across the country. So I agree that we shouldn't run from social issues. I think that what it really boils down to is that every issue for the left is a moral issue, as I said before. Everything, everything is a moral issue. It's not an evidence-based argument. It's not an efficiency-based argument. The right loses because the left argues morality. Bernie Sa every Bernie Sanders tweet, all of them, are, this person is rich and this person is poor. That is wrong. <laughs> right? That's... that's <clears throat> right? And, and then he plays the air bongos for a little while, and then, and then we all move on. But, but, the, but every argument for the left is a fairness, equality, morality argument. The left and the right always comes back with, 
that's just not efficient. It's just not effective. And you're going to lose arguments when you argue that way. So uh, particularly on social policy, I think that the right has some strong points to make. And I think it's a mistake to, to run away from those. I think that what, what really goes to is fear. I think that people on the right know the arguments. They're just afraid to make them because they're afraid of being called intolerant. But it seems to me significantly more intolerant, significantly more intolerant for people to suggest that the government should force a religious Christian baker to cater a gay wedding than it is to suggest that I personally don't have to accept the legitimacy of your marriage. Right? My personal intolerance is one thing. My personal decision that I don't like what you're doing is one thing. You don't have to care. Once the government, the guy, whoever calls the, the government guns first is essentially the fascist right? when, it comes to, when it comes to issues like this. And I think that's how we ought to argue them. Hello. I'm just curious, after making your 2014 video um, about how you say there's no such thing as a moderate Muslim, how can you go... That's not what it says, by the oh, way, but okay. yes. Well, it's mm -hmm. a minority is what you're saying. I said there's a myth that, that it's only a tiny minority of Muslims who are radicalized. Okay. That's, it's called the myth of the radical Muslim minority, the tiny radical Muslim minority. So you, okay, so you still say there's that sizable portion that does have these radicalized views. Sure. You say that in the video. Mm -hmm. How can you attack Donald Trump? for taking this immigration stance that combats that and that understands that until we get the whole situation sorted out over there. Okay, the reason that I don't agree with Donald Trump's Muslim immigration ban, and I said this at the time, is because it is, it is not specific enough. Meaning that, number one, it's, it's slightly impractical in that you can't tell who's a Muslim and who is not when you, when you let people in. Uh, but beyond that, my care is not whether someone prays five times a day toward Mecca. Who am I to criticize? I pray three times a day toward Jerusalem. Right? Like, that's not my business. They, there, are, there, are other, there are other things that we should be looking for. Namely, for example, a form of radicalized Islam refusal to accept Western values. I think that we should have very broad standards, by the way, of, of what prevents you from entering the country. And those extend far beyond religion. So in some ways, I actually think that, that Trump was being too specific and yet too overbroad at the same time. Like, there are Muslim members of the American military, obviously. There are moderate Muslims who do exist in the world. And I think that his, his blanket ban is not well calibrated, particularly because we do have intelligence resources inside the, the Muslim American community and the European Muslim community and abroad, and, and you're going to damage those intelligence capabilities if you suggest that nobody can even come into the country. With that said, I am for very significant restrictions on immigration generally, that don't have to do with religious Muslim practice. Right? So be more specific about what you're looking for, in other words. So, for example, a better measure of whether you should let someone into the country would be place of origin, actually, as opposed to religious practice. So, for example, if, if the person is from, from Syria right now, that person should get more scrutiny than if you are a, a Muslim who is who's residing in Dearborn. I mean, just as an example, right? Because, there are, because by polls, American Muslims are significantly more moderate than, than Muslims who are living in Syria. So, you know, I, I think that we should be more specific than that. I also think that Trump has a habit of saying the loudest thing possible without really thinking about it and then walking it back. And he has walked it back. I mean, he, he started off with no Muslims will enter the country at all, including people who are on vacation. And then he walked that back. Right? And then he said his very rich Muslim friends will come into the country. He said that on MSNBC last week. So this is not, how, how, this is not a well-calibrated immigration policy, in other words. Uh, I think that we should be highly skeptical of anybody who wants to come in the country. We ought to make sure that they have our values, and we should make sure that they're not leeching off our economic system. But I think you can do better than, well, what's the gauge? Like, as soon as, as soon as you find out that somebody prays five times a day toward Mecca, they don't come in, that seems, again, overbroad to me. Hi, Ben. Um, so I was wondering, so most like the safe space, like trigger warning culture, I think right now we can see it's like sort of centered on, you know, like the college, like bubbles, like mm -hmm. on campuses. Um, but do you see kind of like the left changing once these people, you know, that are around our age start, you know, becoming the politicians, start becoming the people in power? Do you think we're going to see anything drastically different than we do today from Absolutely. the Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that we are one justice away from, from hate speech codes being upheld by the Supreme Court. I think the left has moved very fast to the left. I mean, this is why you'll notice that throughout the speech I use the word left. I don't use the word liberal. I don't think they're the same thing. I think the old school liberals have been wiped out by the left, or they are in the process of being wiped out by the left. People like Larry Summers, right, who was a, a Clinton Secretary of the Treasury, was ousted at Harvard for saying true things about discrepancies in hiring between women and men in sciences, 
and because he believed in, in the notion that you should be able to say these things. Right? He was ousted from Harvard because that wasn't sufficiently leftist. There's a new wave of the left that is significantly less interested in free speech. Left, uh, the, liberals used to say, you know, I may disagree with what you say, but I'll die for your right to say it. Now it's, I may disagree with what you have to say, and if I have the chance, maybe I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I think that is bleeding upward. I don't think it's bleeding downward. I don't think it's going to stop when people exit college. If you've created a safe space for yourself, why wouldn't you attempt to perpetuate that beyond your current safe space into the broader panoply of American activities? Thank you so much. So as a Christian, um, I don't support gay marriage, and I definitely don't support uh, gay adoption. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what your argument or if what your view on gay couples adopting is when the left says that it's better for them to be adopted than stay in foster care or be orphans. Right. That, that's, that's called a false choice. There are significantly more couples, married heterosexual couples, who are looking to adopt than there are children who are looking to be adopted in the United States. The adoption system is a complete disaster. I believe that every child deserves a mother and a father. The answer to this, the answer to the adoption crisis is to make a more streamlined adoption system, not to broaden the categories. By the way, I feel the same way about single people adopting. I think every kid deserves a, a mother and a father. End of story. So, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Benoit, thank you for coming. So I brought a um, liberal friend to come uh, listen to you speak today. Oh, good. That's nice. Uh, she made me sit next to a Bernie Sanders supporter during a dinner, so. Retaliation, yeah. It's only fair. Revenge. <laughs> so on the way over here, we got in a discussion about the wage gap between men and women. Yes. And she was saying that in a corporate setting even, that a woman entering the same time as a man is getting paid less for the exact same job. Mm -hmm. And since I was driving, I couldn't just stop and scream at her, but this is wrong. But uh, what would your opinion on this? I mean, it's not my opinion. It's statistical fact. This is bullshit. <laughs> okay. The, 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 <clears throat> this, the, the 78 cents on the dollar myth is just that. It's a myth. Time magazine actually found as early as 2010 that in the 50 biggest cities in the United States, women were actually earning more than men. If they had the same job qualifications, the same number of years in the workforce, the same number of hours worked, the reason that women on average are paid less is because women take time off, they take less risky jobs, they don't take as much time at work, they would rather be home with their families. These are choices that women make. And it's astonishing to me that feminists actually degrade those choices as though it's a terrible thing when a woman takes time off. Well, it's, it's her choice. I mean, I thought that was your whole deal. You know, my, my wife is a perfect example of this. My wife is a doctor, right? She's just graduating from, from UCLA Medical School. Uh, she, she finished all of her classes. She's just graduating in about six weeks. And she's, she's due in five, so we'll see if she... Uh, <laughs> she's having our second baby in, in five, so we'll see if, she, if she's able to walk up to the podium. But, um, <laughs> but she took a year off during medical school because when we had our first kid, she wanted to take a year off to be with our first child, right? That was her choice. I took off four days. Right, that's, that's, that's relatively typical because men are not the ones, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, including how much they want to do it. Men's, men are typically not the ones in the home. And by the way, I'm speaking as somebody who, when I was growing up, my dad was a stay-at-home dad and my mom worked. Right, so I'm fine with whatever choices women want to make about work versus home life. I think there are certain choices that are, are more or less beneficial to the child. But to pretend that these discrepancies don't exist across the broad class of women is just not true. It's just not true. And it's not society's fault. That, that women are given this, as Gavin McInnes says, this magical superpower of being able to create other humans, which is unbelievable and cool, right? And it's now been seen as some sort of horrible affliction by so many women. It is the coolest thing literally on planet Earth, from my perspective, that women can do this. It's unbelievable. And, you know, and being able to recognize that and then say that women are able and free to make the choice to, to engage with that and enjoy it and be, be part of that, you know, that's, that's an aspect of freedom. So if women are being paid less on average, it's because women want to be paid less on average. And if they didn't, they would be in the workforce the same amount as men, and they would be 40, and they would be unmarried, and they wouldn't have kids, and they'd be miserable, right? Because men who do the same thing are generally 40, unmarried, don't have kids, and are miserable, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it, it, being a workaholic has its downsides, in other words. But the workaholics skew some of the statistics. And, and again, men don't have to take off, time off for childbirth. Men can't nurse, unless you're Michael Moore. And it's, <laughs> so 
so that so that's the reason. Don't buy into the myth. If, you re, if it were really true that women were being so much, paid so much less on average than men because there is this vast discrimination, then why wouldn't corporations, these greedy, evil corporations, the same ones that have the Scrooge McDuck money bins, why wouldn't they fire all the men and hire all the cheap women? Right? Why wouldn't they just staff up with women? They're willing to do the same work for 78 cents on the dollar. They don't do that. Why? Because it's not true. Thank you. Look at that. Hi, Ben. I wanted to uh, ask you what you were talking about um, a couple speeches ago about the 501c3. As a Torah observant uh, believer in Yahushua of Nazareth, I'm not a fan of the 501c3. I think it's uh, unconstitutional. It seems to muzzle free speech. It seems to be designed to anyway. But I see such a big movement to push that away. Though I don't belong to a 501c3 organization, I mm -hmm. see that such a long, um, a huge longing on the left for them to shut that down and, you know, tax the churches, we'd have more money, such and such. Mm -hmm. and, and you were talking about how that would kind of destroy the institutions as a whole, and I, I just want to know if you could expound on that. I mean, that. historically speaking, so we'll leave our religious disagreements for another time, but, but, but historically speaking, churches, this has been a major battle always between the crown and the church, right? I mean, this was true in Britain. It, it, when, whenever, whenever the king wanted to get at controlling the church, he would immediately try to revoke their, their property, titles, right, and, and, and their grants and their land grants. Uh, the fact is that, that church independence relies to a certain extent on not being taxed because, as the Supreme Court famously said, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Right. So if you can tax the church out of existence, then churches can cease to exist if the government just doesn't like how your church operates. Um, what, what I have a problem with is, is one of the things that the government has done is they've, they've put up these absurd, absurd laws, these regulations that suggest that if you're a pulpit rabbi or a pulpit pastor or a priest, that you can't speak politically from the podium or they'll revoke your 501c3 status. This is, this is un-American to me. That's I don't understand why this is the case. It doesn't make any sense to me. And there are a lot of gun, there are like a no gun zone, uh, certain churches that you can't, even if you have a concealed I mean, listen, if you're a private church and you don't want people to, to have guns, it's your property. Right. You can regulate but what people do in zones. Are, are owned by the state. Because of the 501c3, that the state has right to the property. I was uh, this was what I was. Well, saying. I mean, I, the state doesn't have the right to your property because it's a 501c3, but they can revoke your 501c3 status if they don't like what you're doing. And so, what you've seen is that the the power of religious communities in the United States and religious leadership has waned dramatically right. because so many people are used to giving tax deductible contributions to 501c3 groups that if that were revoked, the donations would go down dramatically. So they have to walk this fine line where they can say things like. I oppose same-sex marriage, but if there's a piece of legislation in the state that opposes same-sex marriage, they can't say, go out and vote for that, right? It's, it's, it's all idiocy. It's all idiocy. All right. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Ben. I came from, uh, drove from Wisconsin here just to see you. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's, that's um, a bit of a schlep. <laughs> <laughs> Three quick questions. One, will you take a picture with me? <laughs> and two and three are uh, kind of together. Um, what are your views on voter f on uh, voter ID laws, and is the voter fraud argument a uh, legitimate one? Okay, so number one, yes, I will take a picture as time permits. But since you asked first, you get the number one picture. So yeah, you're, so so yes, we'll we'll, we'll definitely do that. Uh, and uh, and how tall are you? This is for all the Milo supporters out there. How tall are you? Five five. <laughs> five five, great. So I'll look really tall next to you. <laughs> Perfect. So okay, so the second the second question was uh, the second question was uh, about, forgive me, the, about voter IDs. Okay, so voter ID laws are perfectly legitimate just as you show ID to buy alcohol or you show ID to get into an R-rated movie. It seems like a very basic requirement that you be the person on your ID before you can vote. And all the people who are saying that this is some sort of racist, evil attempt to stop black people from voting, see, I'm not a racist, so I don't think black people are too stupid to get IDs. It's actually really easy to get an ID, right? All of us have them. Raise your hand in this room if you don't have any form of ID. Right. Okay? <laughs> so the idea, and there are black people in this room. They have ID. It turns out that it's not racially discriminatory to say you might want to show who you are before you vote. Right? And when people say, well, there haven't been any prosecuted cases of voter ID, right, because people don't like prosecuting cases of voter ID because they don't want voter ID. But there's nothing wrong conceptually or practically uh, with, with voter ID laws. And my, my second question was, like, is the voter fraud um, uh, argument from are the right leg a legitimate one? Yeah, I mean, considering that, that John F. Kennedy never would have been president if it hadn't been for dead people in Chicago voting, yeah. I mean, the, the walk when the walking dead are consistently voting for one political party, <laughs> then at least you have to consider the possibility that maybe it would be good if they showed ID proving that they weren't dead. 
Thank you. Hey ben, um, I just want to say uh, before I ask my question, it is very possible and maybe even more consistent to be a libertarian and against abortion. It's a moral question about when you think life begins. I agree. Okay. And the second, uh, I guess my question is, so uh, I don't know if you've heard about the chalking going on on the Diag. Um, yeah, you may, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was done, there were hashtags like stop Islam, stop the rape of Europe. So in response, uh, leftist groups went out and, and said uh, solidarity with Islam, we support Muslim students. There was one, uh, the, the irony of which I found too painful to ignore, um, hashtag uh, queer solidarity for Islam. Uh, there is. Yeah, you can write that on the on the pavement here at University of Michigan. Try it in Saudi Arabia sometime. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I wouldn't recommend that in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wrote under it. I quoted um, what is admittedly a weak narration uh, from Muhammad. Uh, that, but there's no poverty of condemnation of homosexuality in Islam. But I, I, I mm -hmm. quote it, uh, wherever you find uh, people committing the sin of the people of Lot, kill the one doing it and the one to whom it is done. I just wanted to ca challenge uh, cognitive, cognitive dissonance okay. on the part of Muslim students and uh, on queer, uh, queer students. Milo retweeted that, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the, 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 one of the main attacks, attacks that I get from things like this is, oh, you're just doing it for attention. You know, you're an attention whore, and um, uh, yeah, that's basically the idea. It's it's less <laughs> substance and more. And I'm sure you get a lot of this. You get called a jerk. You get you know. I mean, you're yeah. I mean, that's that's right that's now. true. How you know? do you answer that? Well, I mean, what I'm saying is either true or not. End of story. I mean, in my in my now quasi famous catchphrase, facts don't care about your feelings. So, if you are you know, if I if I chalk something that's true, then it's true. By the way, I will note that. And what do you say about not the right time, not the right place? Oh, who dictates that? I mean, really, who dictates right time, right place exactly? Like, it's a true fact is a true fact. I do believe that, you know, maybe people can perceive you as being rude, but yeah, okay. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, I, there, there, there are a couple things I don't like about, about what the left does when you say something factual. One is the idea that the fact itself is wrong if the timing is wrong. That's not true. The fact can be right. It can still be rude, but the fact, if the fact is the fact, then it's a fact. And second is impugning the character of the person who, who speaks the fact, right? So I don't like you as a human, therefore the fact must be wrong. No, again, the fact is either right or the fact is wrong, right? So that's the, it's, it's, it's very simple, you know, it's, it... I don't want to racialize this, but it's pretty black and white. Well, thank you. I, 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 I wish more people thought like you. So it's, it's a, a, one, one additional note that I think actually is worthwhile in the context of, of quoting the Quran and, and quoting various religions. As somebody who is a deep believer in the Old Testament, right, there are a significant number of portions in the Old Testament that are, that are replete with violence. And I'm, I'm somebody who reads it in the original Hebrew, right, so I, I, I know this. I care significantly less about what any religion scriptures say than what the adherents to that religion do. Right. I mean, Le Le Leviticus 18.22 also recommends significant penalties for homosexuality, but it's been a really long time since Christians and Jews were actually perpetrating these penalties for homosexuality. It's happening right now across the world in Islamic countries. First of all, thank you for being here. Um, my question is, Bill Whittle has said like, on um, the PJ Media YouTube channel mm -hmm. that if Ted Cruz gets a Republican nomination, the ideal vice presidential candidate would be Carly Fiorina. Do you agree with that statement? Um, I, I'm, I'm of the view that vice presidential nominees really don't matter very much unless they're Sarah Palin. Um, <laughs> you know, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the, historically speaking, people think that the vice president makes a lot more difference than the vice president makes, which is why Bush can pick you know, a guy from a state with, with less than two people. Like, he picked the only person in Wyoming to be his vice president, right? And, and, he, and he can win the presidency. So Carly Fiorina would be a good attack. Uh, she, she's a good attack vehicle. She's, she's, very, she's very smooth on attack. You know, she, a, as a woman, there's an identity politics that allows her to attack Hillary Clinton in ways that, that some of the other people on the stage probably couldn't. I think she'd be a fine VP pick, Carly Fiorina. And I think that, I think, but there, I think there are plenty of, of people who would be decent VP picks for, for Senator Cruz. Again, at this point, all I care about in the presidential race is that the nominee is not Donald Trump. Hi, 
So um, as a computer science major, um, I've argued with a lot of people about this whole gender gap thing in STEM. Um, like, a lot of my friends say that we need more women in STEM. My, my personal opinion is we need smart people in STEM. It doesn't matter what your gender is. And, um, I'm curious as to what you think about that. I totally agree, obviously. I mean, STEM only moves forward if you have the smartest people who are working in it. You know, affirmative action is not useful in developing you know, greater technologies or better things, right? No one cares whether the race of Jonas Salk when he develops the polio vaccine, we just need a polio vaccine, right? No one, ca you, no one in this room really knows the race or ethnicity of the people who developed all of the various aspects of the laptop that you use today. All you know is that you have a really nice laptop because smart people worked on it, right? N no one, no one cares. When I buy a product, the first thing that goes through my head is not, I wonder what color was the person who built this product. It was, this is either nice or it's a piece of crap, right? I mean, that's, that's, and so, I am always a, a quality of the human being, quality of the product, quality of the, of the intellect, quality of the virtue over identity politics. I hate identity politics. I find it absolutely revolting. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Howdy. Uh, are you familiar, uh, and can you elaborate? I think you mentioned it, but I'm not sure about the 569, I believe, bill that was passed by 133 Democrats in the Congress on trying to uh, bring into a law punishing uh, anybody who criticizes uh, a religion. They meant Islam, of course, and justifiably criticizing aspects of political Islam. Are you familiar with it? Uh, I'm, also... I'm not. I'm not at the congressional level. I know there were UN resolutions that were pushed to this effect and that the Obama administration allowed to get through, but... but... As far as a congressional act, that I'm unaware of. Okay, so I'm talking about also the human, uh, the United Nations OIC right. collaboration with Hillary Clinton on mm -hmm. trying yeah. to pass. Could you elaborate on that because this is a very important issue? Well, I mean, the, the, there's been there's been complaints for a long time, and I think that they're well founded that, that the Obama administration has been working inside the United Nations uh, in order to promulgate. Uh, measures that are acceptable to the Organization of Islamic Countries about criminalizing blasphemy. And the Obama administration has basically taken a hands-off view of this. They've essentially said, okay, if you go forward with that, you know, we also don't like offensive speech about religion, offensive speech about Islam in particular. And you see that reinforced throughout the Obama administration, right? I mean, before the Charlie Hebdo attacks, when everyone was tweeting, including the Obama administration, you know, je suis Charlie Hebdo, like a year before that, the Obama administration was condemning Charlie Hebdo for being insensitive to Muslims. And, and, you know, again, the Obama administration was condemning YouTube videos, crappy YouTube videos for Muslims murdering four Americans in Benghazi. They seem very, very comfortable with condemning people for Islamophobia when, when Muslims then proceed to kill people. Like, this is, that, that's, that's troublesome to me. And, and my understanding is that they've been doing that at the UN more broadly. Hi, um, hi Ben. Um, I'm current. I'm a freshman at the University of Michigan, mm -hmm. and I kind of label myself as a conservative. Mm -hmm. And basically, I completely agree with you with the sense that the First Amendment, I guess, at any university anywhere, is a complete farce. Um, I just wanted to um, bring back, talk about this moment where, in the beginning of the year. Basically, what I want to say is it just pains me to see how the university administration is such a slave to the left. I mean, they required all freshmen in the beginning of the year to attend this program called uh, some bystander intervention program, where they basically told me, they told all freshmen to basically what you said. They told me that, you know, you cannot ask people where they're going on for vacations because that would imply that they are of lower status than you, or you cannot ask people where they're from. Right. So my question is, I'm basically really against this, but a part of me wants to do something about this, mm -hmm. but a part of me realizes that, you know, the moment I say something controversial to the left, right. you know, I might be marked for like the next three years. On you will campus. be, yeah. So, my, my <laughs> is, so, you know, the University of Michigan is such a great institution. It has many great things. My question is, should I just take the best of what it has to offer and ignore the rest, or... Is, do I even have a You have to be smart about it. So, I mean, so I'll say two things, and you have to balance these two competing values. One is that you're part of the fight whether you like it or not, right? Just by being here, you've already made yourself part of the fight. By, by asking this question, you're now on tape. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> uh, 
the, the left is not in the habit of leaving people alone. They're in the habit of harassing people. And so you're going to have to embrace the fight sooner or later. That said, don't do silly things that are going to impede your career development. As I said before, if you have to write like a communist, write like a communist. Like, I'm very happy I graduated summa cum laude from UCLA and then cum laude from Harvard Law School because now I can use the Harvard Law degree that they so love and cherish against them. It makes it very difficult for them to argue I'm stupid when I have the same law degree as their president. <laughs> right? So, this is, so, so, in other words, be strategic in how you approach these things. This is why you know, I, I think there are other people out there who say, yeah, you should always just fight. You should always just fight. No, you shouldn't always just fight. You should pick your spots. You should be smart. And, uh, and you should always re remember the end goal. The end goal is success. If you really want to win, the best way to win is to become really successful in your field of endeavor, become extraordinarily rich, and then give a major donation to the school on the contingency that they fire all the fascist professors. All right, we have time for two more questions. Hi, Ben. Howdy. I'm Rosie Lane. I'm a sophomore at Hillsdale College studying politics and history. I'm here with the wonderful Hillsdale Yaf group. And well, thanks for coming, guys. Sure, so a little bit of a way. Uh, my question for you today is going to center. So recently in my American political thought class, we've been talking about vernacular, and we've been reading Richard Rorty and kind of a critique of, of Rorty's philosophy, essentially that vernacular and rhetoric can shape our culture. And I think that's what we see today with if you say something, it's xenophobic, racist, homophobic, or it's mm -hmm. bigotry. My question to you is how, is, how can conservatives concisely and cogently reclaim vernacular and use that in a competitive way against the left? Okay, so one, this is a great question. So one of the questions that I'm, that I'm frequently asked by religious people who are my fans, I have a lot of religious fans, is, as you know, sometimes I drop the occasional curse word. The reason that this is strategic, okay, the reason that I drop an occasional curse word is because people our age say bullshit. Right? I mean, people our age don't say BS, they say bullshit. Right? And, and so in order to communicate with people in a way that they understand, you can't say, oh, that's nonsense. Now you're an old guy, right? You have to, you have to say bullshit or it doesn't, or it doesn't count. So, the, there's an, so, so the, the important point here is that you actually have to speak the vernacular in order to combat the vernacular. The problem for conservatives is that they want to go all Russell Kirk on people. When someone calls you racist, then you start quoting Russell Kirk at them and it's, you, you lose. I'm sorry, it's over. Right? There, there, is, there is something to the notion that you have to respond in kind. So if somebody says that you're a racist, as I've said before, the proper response is not, let's have a discussion of you know, whether I'm a racist or whether I'm not, what policies I pursue that you believe are racist. The proper response is, you're calling me a racist without evidence, which makes you a jackass. <laughs> right? Because this is a vernacular that they understand. You have to speak to the level that people, that people are speaking to you with. Right? Um, and, uh, and honestly, I think this is why Trump is, is winning right now. The reason he's winning is because most of America is speaking at fourth grade level, and so is he. <laughs> so, it's, it's, so it's important to... <sighs> By the way, that's not, that's not even really a rip on Trump. The real rip on Trump is that he's only capable of speaking at a fourth grade level. <laughs> but <clears throat> but, it's, but the, the point is that conservatives have to get off our high horse just a little bit if we want to have conversations with people that they actually understand. Otherwise, people feel like we're talking down to them or tutting them all the time. Hi, Ben. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is about essentially how to deal with uh, Bernie Sanders supporters. Mm -hmm. uh, in one specific regard, I live with... Well, I mean, start by taking half their money and telling them you deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> so I live with somebody who's a very big Bernie Sanders supporter. I'm sorry. And <laughs> by the way, unsolicited dating advice, folks, do not date Bernie Sanders supporters. Just don't do it. They're going to take all your stuff and leave. Basically, our conversations always go along the lines of I bring up something that I saw in the news that makes Bernie Sanders, you know, beliefs and ideas and policies look pretty, you know, just Right, you bring up reality, reality. And, and, <laughs> and the response is always something along the lines of, well, there's a political revolution, and that's the most important thing, the fact that there's going to be some sort of political revolution. So my question is, just how do you talk to someone who doesn't care about the policies, about the implications of the policies, and only cares about the idea of a political revolution? Well, I mean, the, the first thing that he should understand about political revolutions is that at the beginning they're awesome, and five years later your head is on the guillotine block. <laughs> right, I mean, political revolutions are very risky business. And, you know, there's really only been a couple of revolutions in human history that have worked out well. Uh, so, you know, the, the political revolution of Bernie Sanders does not promise joy. Uh, it, 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 that it, it, He's not engaging you in a discussion, obviously. He's sloganeering. 
Okay, so it's a political revolution. What is the content of that? One of the things that I always urge people to do is ask questions. Don't argue, ask questions. What do you even mean by that? What does that mean? What, is the what kind of political revolution are you talking about? What's going to change when Bernie Sanders is elected president in unicorn land? Right? Well, well, what exactly, how, how are things going to change when a man older than Methuselah <laughs> actually <laughs> occupies the White House and can't get up the stairs without, without, the, the, without the electronic stair lift? <clears throat> you know, so so you, you, have to, you have to put, the, the left doesn't understand how to, how to defend their own positions because the truth is that most leftist positions are, are kind of indefensible. And Bernie Sanders is, are particularly indefensible because they're at war with every element of logic and evidence. They, that, which is why he keeps sloganeering. So you have to dig into the slogan. The second recommendation, don't engage the guy. I mean, come on. You only have a certain number of breaths left in your life. And when you're on, and not to be dark, but when you're about to move into the mahogany condo and you look around at your life and you think, boy, I wish I had a couple of hours back, this will be the number one place that you look. <laughs> so pick your spots, folks. I mean, Facebook debates with, with Bernie Sanders supporters, this is not where you ought to be spending your time. Go out there, get a job get married, have kids, be a productive member of society, be decent to one another, everything will end up fine. And the Bernie Sanders supporters, you're not going to have to worry about them because they're all going to be living in Occupy tents pooping on themselves sooner or later. <laughs> Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Um, if you would like a photo with uh, Ben Shapiro, please get in a line along here. Uh, it is going to be really, really quick. No times for questions or comments. It's just going to be a picture and just go uh, as through as fast as we can for 15 minutes. Uh, but thank you so much, everybody who has come tonight. Yeah, I have to take off. Thank you. Good job. Uh, the case for that is in that room. Good. All right. Where did you, how do you turn this on? What do you want?